Welcome to Gay Liberation Network's monthly show on Can TV. My name is Buddy Bell, and I'm sitting next to my guest, Nadia Solereri Unzueta Carrasco. Um, and we're going to be talking today about uh, a campaign called the Undocubus. Um, so we'll take your calls in about um, in some minutes, but first we have a few announcements. Um, this is our website that you may check out, gayliberation.net. And we have a number of events coming up. Uh, there's a report back from Honduras uh, in which GLN's Andy Thayer will be um, among the speakers there. And uh, there's a protest that's scheduled to happen at the fundraiser for the IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, and that's October 29th. And uh, we also want to remind you that there's a boycott against Chick-fil-A. The CEO of Chick-fil-A has said that uh, his corporation is opposed to uh, same-sex marriage marriage equality and uh, has refused to enact a uh, anti-discrimination clause for employees. And so those are some of the announcements. Welcome to the show. Um, first tell us a little bit about what is Undocubus? So um, the Undocubus is uh, technically a, uh, this project called the No Papers, No Fear, Right for Justice. Um, with the sort of the nickname being Undocubus because it was a bus that went from Phoenix, Arizona to Charlotte, North Carolina filled with undocumented people of all ages and from sort of all walks of life, right, going through the southern parts of the U.S., supporting local communities, supporting the work being organized there, um, occasionally helping to organize an action or two. Um, and in, in that ride, right, the idea was like, we don't have papers, but we're also fighting against this fear that um, the politics of, of anti, like the anti-immigrant politics are trying to, to sort of include so that people feel like they need to leave their homes. Okay, so tell <laughs> us a little bit about who you are, Ireri, and um, how you got involved in this movement. Okay, um, so I uh, was born in Mexico, the Cito Federal, and I came to the U.S. with my family when I was seven. Um, we originally came on a tourist visa and my dad uh, was offered a job here, which is why he decided to come. Um, but at the company he was working with, and um, I'm not sure if they either couldn't or they didn't want to, but they didn't really look into how we could regularize our status with them. And um, eventually, our <laughs> status ran out. And so I've been undocumented in the United States. I'm 25 now. Uh, and I originally got involved with a group called the Immigrant Youth Justice League, fighting the deportation of one of our friends. I've been uh, doing that work for three years, and so when I heard about the Undocubus, I was like, great, <laughs> like this is a project that will bring together people of all ages and actually take us to do some of the places where the harshest immigration laws are passing. All right, and you mentioned <laughs> Immigrant Youth Justice League. What, just very briefly explain that. Um, so the Immigrant Youth Justice League, League is a group here in Chicago that began in 2009 to try to stop the deportation of one of our friends um, from that group. I think that that was the first time that I was in a room filled with other young undocumented people who had had similar experiences as myself. Um, before that, most of my friends were either citizens or they were undocumented people who'd come here at, at an older age. And um, we had a lot of differences. And, and so this was one of the groups where I found a space where we could share experiences and share resources of what we'd lived through. And we've done, um, campaigns to stop deportations of different people. We do a lot of work around access to education for young undocumented people. Um, and recently, I think we've been thinking about like how do we broaden our work and make it more inclusive of a lot of different people, including um, supporting people out in the suburbs. Great. Well, I want to get back to the, um, the specific undocumented bus campaign and tell us a little bit about how the um, route was picked out. Why did you mm -hmm. start in Phoenix and go to Charlotte? Um, well, Phoenix is one of the places with the harshest anti-immigrant laws, right? It's where SB 1070 uh, was signed into law and um, the day that we actually left was, well, there was mechanical problems, but the day that, that some people left um, was on 
the, um, I think, kind of like the anniversary of uh, the signing of SB 1070. And uh, what we did was we went through the places where uh, a lot of these anti-immigrant laws were passing. Like Georgia has one of those laws, like Alabama, right? Um, North Carolina and, and Charlotte. Not only was it the National uh, Democratic Convention, but it was also one of the places where uh, the program 287G uh, started, which is where police can sort of get certified to act as immigration and also where the program Secure Community started, and that's one of the biggest dragnets that has pulled people into deportation for merely having some type of contact with police. Uh, 287G was a um, program that was, in a, uh, well, um, put into place by Sheriff Arpaio, uh, among other places, mm -hmm. in, who's the sheriff in Phoenix. Um, and I just wanted to quote for you a um, 2009 report by the media watchdog group Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, um, their report said, even when uh, news coverage directly involves and impacts Latinos, their voices are scarce. Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpaio has been interviewed or featured on cable television at least 21 times in the past year when the topic is immigration and 17 of those times on CNN. Yet in that same year, those targeted by Arpaio's policies, those um, who are bearing the brunt of this, uh, they have only twice been included in the conversation. What do you think about that? I think it's true, right? I think people um, that have sort of higher political positions um, often get a lot more media time um, than other people, but I actually think that uh, it's been really, really awesome how a lot of undocumented people have sort of been developing these social networks and these other areas where we're able to get our voices heard and, and like sort of be able to just have some space um, outside of, of our communities, right, where we're actually on different types of media. And uh, actually, let's uh, move on to Charlotte because um, we actually have a video uh, to show you all. But um, first of all, um, explain again what happened in in Charlotte, what, why was, why would, did you arrive in Charlotte? Um, so as I said before, right, Charlotte, uh, North Carolina was the place where the National Democrat Convention was happening. The National Democratic Convention was happening and um, the voices of undocumented people haven't really been heard by the Democrats nor by the Republicans. So the Republicans have decided to ignore us completely, I think. Um, and the Democrats have kind of tried to say like, okay, we understand, but at the same time, not really taking a hard stance in defense of undocumented immigrant communities. And so we needed to take our message um, to President Obama, right? So that's one of the reasons we went. And the other reason is because in um, Charlotte, there have been a lot of anti-immigrant policies, right? The 287G, the Secure Communities, and their local groups, they're doing amazing work trying to stop the deportations, um, right? And, and like, for me, being able to go to these places, for me coming from Chicago, right, which is a place where um, it's relatively safer than in other places to be undocumented, um, for me, the part of that powerful, like, act of solidarity, right, was in, in going and being able to support that work. And what ended up happening is that we uh, did a civil disobedience in front of the Democratic National Convention, and it was uh, young people, and it was parents, and it was people that had uh, prior, like, previously been deported and people that had had encounters with ICE before. Um, so, like, for me, that was really, really powerful. It wasn't any longer just young people who technically qualified for the DREAM Act, right? It was people of all sorts who had all types of risks um, going for them, and I was very proud to be part of that action. All right, let's watch the clip. <laughs> We're getting off the bus. We travel all the way from Phoenix, Arizona to North Carolina. We have been on the road for six weeks. We stop in different communities. We stop in different states. We're here to tell President Obama that we're not afraid anymore. We are here gathered today to see where Obama's legacy will lead. For he be the president who has the most deportations that any president has ever had, or will he be the president that stands up for a community that is a part of the country? This is also walking the street. 
You're in the middle of the of an intersection there. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we have music. They're saying no papers, no fear. What are you saying there? Oh, that's not me. That's uh, Isela. <laughs> there are some other people who did a civil civilians in Phoenix, Arizona before we left. Okay, so you had a, a similar action in Phoenix, mm -hmm. and then uh, to end you, you also, t um, yeah. that in Phoenix they also blocked an intersection, and yeah. um, in Charlotte you blocked an intersection. And, and in that video we saw one person uh, in the beginning saying, um, Obama, what is he going to do? Is he going to be, continue to be the president who um, under his watch, more deportations than ever are, are happening, um, or is he going to make a change? Uh, in, in the headlines, we see all this about deferred action, this um, supposed reform. What to you and to the other people in, on DocuBus is lacking in that reform, and why is it that you want to um, do an action up to and including risking arrest uh, in order to bring more attention to the needs that are unmet by this reform? Well, I can only speak for myself um, right now, and I think that uh, part of the conversations that I had with people and, and my own opinion is that, um, all right, good, right, there's this tool now that we can use to defend people from deportations, particularly young people. Um, particularly people that don't have criminal records and that kind of like there's a whole bunch of criteria right so there's this tool that we can use um, and if we can use it we should but that doesn't cover our parents that doesn't cover young people who ended up dropping out of high school right and, and don't have their GEDs that doesn't cover a lot of people and um, not just that but um, as uh, through my experience I wouldn't say that I always trust uh, immigration and customs enforcement to do what they what they uh, said they would do or to even listen to what the president is saying right because before deferred action um, there was this other there is this other policy called prosecutorial discretion in which immigration customs enforcement is supposed to have discretion about whether or not they close someone's case and uh, from the groups that I've worked with in the past nationally like I know that there are a lot of people who technically qualify but who are still in deportation proceedings because immigration knows that they have the resources to do it right and so for me like we call it DACA, deferred action. Um, great, that's a tool, let's use it, but let's not forget that organizing is what has gotten us to this place and organizing is what's gonna help defend our communities um, from immigration and customs enforcement at the moment and also make sure that we have the resources to continue to, to try to live our lives. And specifically, um, you know, people who are um, in uh, specifically like LGBT um, folks who are undocumented or people who um, are live in communities where there's more likelihood of being um, uh, harassed by the police, right? Mm -hmm. There's this uh, action doesn't 
help them as much. If you have a criminal record uh, that nullifies this whole uh, reform for you, um, if you are in love with someone of the same gender uh, who's a citizen, you cannot uh, still, you cannot get a path to citizenship through, um, through the regular Mm -hmm. uh, path that a lot of people take through uh, heterosexual marriage. Yeah. Um, so specifically, uh, this this reform doesn't go uh, too far. What do you think about um, the re the the lacking the ways that this reform is lacking uh, in terms of more um, vulnerable communities? I honestly think that uh, it doesn't solve all the problems, right? But I don't believe that any legislation is going to solve all the problems, even if there was to be some type of immigration reform, right, or um, amnesty, which people are usually scared of the word. Um, I don't think that that would actually solve a lot of the problems that I'm seeing. Um, and so I think that uh, for me, really, like, I keep thinking, like, organizing, right, like, Concrete <laughs> victories are very, very important um, things that are that bring tangible benefits to a community, but that also bring it closer together, um, where people learn how to work together with each other and be in solidarity with each other across communities. I think that that's really, really important, right? And and I know even though Chicago isn't a particularly dangerous place, like there's still people in deportation proceedings, and and not just that, but like if you just go out to the suburbs, like to McHenry County, like those are places where people are still getting caught in, in drug nets like secure communities. I think it's interesting that you say amnesty, everyone's <laughs> afraid of that word, but isn't it uh, um, President Reagan who in the 80s said, well, I, I'm in favor of an amnesty uh, to legalize folks who are here without documentation. Um, and now, you know, Reagan is the liberal, <laughs> on the liberal end of the spectrum on this issue. Um, and I wanted to call, to actually go into uh, something in IGEL, Immigrant Youth Justice League, on, on your website. Uh, years ago, I've, I remember reading many people's stories about coming out as an undocumented person and this idea um, that we are, we are going to progress, undocumented people will progress when more people come out. And that seems to be on parallel with the LGBT movement. The more of us who come out, uh, the better conditions will become, the better um, able, we'll be able to uh, gain reforms. What do you think about that comparison? It's, um, it is a parallel in a lot of ways. Um, I think that uh, my experience as someone who identifies as queer is very much connected to having learned about the history of coming out um, and then applying that to other aspects of my life, um, specifically being undocumented, right? And um, I think that uh, when we started talking about coming out, we were like, okay, right, um, people that are part of the LGBT community, like, come out of the closet, right? Like, what do we come out of as undocumented people? And so um, we had, like, a long talk, and we were like, hmm, the shadows? So we have this campaign called Coming Out of the Shadows, right? And the idea is that um, pretty much I think pretty much every person um, will have had contact with someone who's undocumented at some point, right? Whether it's someone who is a student in their class or someone who uh, is a student with their kids or, or someone who's working at wherever store they happen to shop at. Like, I really honestly believe that almost everyone will have had contact with someone who's undocumented. And so when that person knows that this other person is a human being with a life, right, with a family who has been building uh, their life here, that um, people will be like, hmm, you know, maybe these aren't just whatever, like, anti-immigrant arguments there are. Like, these aren't people that are here to take our jobs. These aren't people that are strangers, right? A lot of times I hear, oh, like, immigrants, they're not part of the community, they're not blah, blah, blah. But, in, like, I've been living here for 18 years. Um, and there's people that have been living here for longer. There's people that have been living for 20 years. There's people that have been living here for a year, right? But that doesn't mean that they don't belong just as much as anybody else. So it's very, very connected. I think one big difference, though, is that um, when I come out as queer, it's because I want people to know who I am and, 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 and to uh, understand right about my life um, and to, to love me for who I am. And when I come out as undocumented, I come out because I want people to act in solidarity with me to change the status. 
Um, so I think that th that's a, sort of a different outcome. Uh, we have about a minute left, and uh, I wanted to ask you, what's, you know, uh, what's the real hope that we can believe in in this uh, election season and beyond? What's the real hope we can believe in in terms of what's the um, actions or changes you've seen recently that um, gives you hope that we're going to keep progressing on this and um, uh, keep pushing for more reforms? Well, um, I think one of that, that, that hope is something that I saw on the No Papers, No Fear Ride which was this intergenerational um, collaboration almost. Uh, most of the work that I've done in the past few years have, have, has been with young people. And I remember thinking like, oh, people that are older, um, what I was then calling adults that I'm kind of now a part of, right? These older people have families that they have to support and all this stuff. Like, I don't know if they're, <laughs> if they're gonna like be as public as I ever am, so I'm going to do it, right? But in honesty, like when I got arrested this last time, I was arrested with my parents. Um, one other friend was arrested with her mom and there were just people who um, I never thought would be willing to take those risks, and, and they are. And I was very, very impressed by that, right? That, the big impression um, about the fact that people are willing to take up these risks and to fight for our communities. Wonderful, and we hope it, it happens uh, many more times. Um, just while, and while we're ending the program, we want to bring your attention back to uh, these upcoming events that are upcoming. Um, and uh, there's the Death Squad Democracy report back from Honduras. And please come out to the protest against Israeli Defense Forces, uh, the fundraiser, as they um, continue to occupy the West Bank and Gaza. And remember that we are boycotting Chick-fil-A until they uh, say that they will enact a non-discrimination clause for their employees and stop giving to uh, people against uh, equal marriage. And please come out to our next meeting, uh, first Wednesday of the month at Burger Park Cultural Center. Our next show, every second Friday, our next show is November 9th at this same time.